Well, welcome to Church Online. My name is Pete, pastor here at City on a Hill, and it's a joy to welcome each and every one of you to our, our gathering today online. We're, we've been working through a, a series looking at church history, and we don't usually look at that kind of stuff in church. But to be honest, we've had 2,000 years of inspiring, incredible stories of what God has done down through the last two millennia. And the one thing that's consistent throughout the last 2,000 years is that God's used ordinary people like you, like me, people who are willing. And so today we're going to be diving back into our church history series and I'm going to be talking to you about a particular man and the movement that he led. And I believe it will inspire you for what God wants to do in our generation. So whether this is your first time with us or whether it's a regular experience, great to have you connecting. Let's pray that God will speak to us. Lord God, thank you so much that you're on the throne. Thank you, you love each and every person connecting. I pray as we take this time to now learn from history, I pray you'd speak to us, impact our lives and inspire us with what you want, us to, what, with what you want to do in our lives. And I pray for anyone connecting today who hasn't yet got a relationship with you, I pray that today they would connect with Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me start with a story. There was a... Uh, an a art thief and he broke into the Louvre in Paris and it was an incredibly well-planned theft and he broke in and he managed to steal some Van Gogh, he stole some Monet paintings and he stole some Degas paintings and uh, everything was going according to his plan and he managed to get out with undetected and he got all the paintings into his van and he was driving away in his van and he only got two blocks and then he ran out of fuel. And so the police managed to catch him. They, they pulled him, they, they, they was there in this pulled over van. And they said to him, sir, you, your, <coughs> your plan was so clever. Your plan was so clever, but you ran out of fuel. What happens? And he says, I had no money to buy the gas, to make the Van Gogh. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> what's that got to do with church history? Well, I'm going to talk to you about a man who actually in his early 20s or 19 years old, he, his life was changed in an art gallery looking at painting. But before I take you to the story, let me read some verses which I think frame very well the life of Nicholas Ludwig van Zinzendorf. This is uh, what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, and I guess you could say that's like the 2,000 years of history we've had, great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, <clears throat> who for the joy set before him he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hands of the throne of God. Zinzendorf was born in, the se in 1700 in Dresden in Germany. He was born into a wealthy, aristocratical family. He was converted at a young age, came to faith in Jesus, and from the get-go, he was passionate about Jesus and wanted his life to make a difference. He went to study law at Wittenberg University, and when he'd finished studying law, age 19, he took a trip through Europe to see some of the cultural highlights of Europe. And when he was on this trip through Europe, there he came to Dusseldorf Art Museum. And in the art museum, there was a painting there. And the painting was painted by Domenico Fetti, and the painting was entitled Ecce Homo, which means Behold the Man. The painting was of Jesus, and it's the, it's the moment when Jesus has been arrested. He's been mocked, he's been whipped, and he's been clothed in a purple robe, and he's now brought before the crowds, and Pilate says to the crowds, Behold the man. And this painting of Jesus, Zinzendorf is a 19-year-old staring at this painting, and impacted by the thoughts of what Jesus was doing on our behalf. And underneath the painting, it had the words, I have done this for you, what have you done for me? And Zinzendorf was contemplating that thought 
and, and this is, he, re, he records the prayer he prayed, and he said this, I have loved him for a long time, but I've never actually done anything for him. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do. That's a bold prayer. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do. And I want to just stop there before I go into the rest of what happens next is amazing. But before I get into that, let me just say this. The verse we read says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. And I want to say to you, if you're a believer today, or maybe today, if you're not yet a believer, fix your eyes on Jesus. When you fix your eyes on Jesus, the one who died in that cross, I mean, look at the cross. What does that say to you? I mean, it says to me, there's a God in heaven who loves me so much. When I look at the cross, I think, God has done something for me. I'm not thinking, what can I do for God? I'm thinking, what has God done for me? And it's what God has done for me, and it's what God has done for you, and it's what God did for Zinzendorf that motivated him for the rest of his entire life. And, and the Bible says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. It's that impact that that has. So I want to encourage you today, if you're not yet, maybe you're not yet there with God, and I encourage you today, why not make the greatest decision of your life and give yourself to him who gave himself for you. Trust Jesus to be your saviour. Forgive your sins, give you a new start, restore you into a relationship with God. But maybe you're a believer today and you know, you're hearing this message and you're hearing what Zinzendorf prayed. I will do whatever you ask me to do. From now on, I will do whatever you lead me to do. Why not take a moment to pray that prayer yourself? Say it together. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do. That's such a courageous prayer. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do. So what happened next? Well, three years later, Zinzendorf inherited a very large estate in Berthelsdorf, 70 miles from Dresden. And he, at the time, was working for the government of Saxony. <clears throat> After inheriting this huge estate, his friend Christian Davids asked him if a number of Moravian refugees could come, a few families, and live on some of the land in his estate. Zinzendorf remembered the prayer he prayed, whatever you ask me to do, I will do. And he saw this as an outworking of that. So he said, yeah. So he welcomed, and this was the first group of 10 Moravians refugees arrived in December 1722. Now the Moravians, they were the spiritual descendants of a man by the name of Jan Hus. If you've ever been in Prague, in the city centre in Prague in Wenceslas Square, there is a statue of Jan Hus, who was a reformer who challenged the status quo and who was actually burnt at the stake in the square in Prague for his faith in Jesus. <clears throat> and the Moravians were followers of Jesus whose, whose parents and, or grandparents had come to faith through the leadership of Jan Hus. And so they were a persecuted minority Christian group who were running from place to place, being persecuted by the counter-reformers in, in Europe and they for 300 years have been a persecuted group. So this group of Moravians, uh, on the run for their lives, were given refuge in Count Zinzendorf's land. And the first group of 10 of them arrived in December 1722. By May 1725, now Zinzendorf's 25 years old, there was 90 of them. And by 20, 1726, there was 300 of them. And by 1732, the group of Moravian refugees on his lands had grown to over 600. They formed a community of believers and they called it Hernhut, which means the Lord's safekeeping. Unfortunately, when you get a whole pile of human beings together, even if they're the most earnest of Christians, people are people. We're transformed, but we've still got our rough edges. And so it wasn't long before there was a bit of bickering in the community, people were falling out with each other, rough edges, people were rubbing up against each other, there were clashes. And Zinzendorf at that point having been pretty passive, stepped in and became their pastor. He stepped in and started doing daily Bible studies with them and helping settle disputes. He got, at one point, in one meeting, he got them all to sit down and ask forgiveness from each other and to resolve their conflicts and confess their sins. And together they created what they called the Brotherly Agreement, where and everyone in the community, the hundreds of people there, signed the Brotherly Agreement, agreeing 
that they were going to live in forgiveness, they were going to resolve their differences, and they were going to live with a humility with each other. On the back of signing the brotherly agreement, on the back of repenting for their bickering and for their disunity, the Holy Spirit came in power. August 1727, it was a communion service. The Moravian community had gathered. They'd all been repenting for their disunity. And the Holy Spirit came, just like on the day of Pentecost and the beginning of the church. Holy Spirit came in power. And uh, it, it was such an incredible defining moment. I guess you could say that that was the birth of the Moravian church. And what you see happen next is it birthed two passions in the hearts of that community. The first passion was a huge passion for prayer. And boy, what a passion. It initiated a hundred years of continual 24 seven prayer. They called it prayer watch. And all the members of the Moravian community in Herrenhut agreed to take on an hour each throughout the week. And they covered 24 seven throughout the week and they prayed and they sustained this prayer for over a hundred years. A hundred years of prayer watch, a hundred years of 24 seven prayer. Incredible. The other thing that was birthed was a passion for prayer and a passion for missions. And what a passion it was. In the years that followed, in fact, over the next 150 years from this community, they sent out 2,000 missionaries. They sent missionaries to the Caribbean, to North and South America, to the Arctic. I mean, wow, are there even people there to reach? To Greenland, to Lapland, Turkey, Africa, and the Far East. It was, you could say, the first large-scale Protestant missionary movement on earth. Incredible, from this community of persecuted believers who had been bickering. The Holy Spirit comes, he births in them a passion for prayer, and they start 100 years of 24-7 prayer and a passion for mission. Zinzendorf himself, on the back of these experiences, starts traveling around Europe, the UK and America, establishing communities in line with the pattern he's experienced in Herrenhut. Communities of believers, churches, from which they pray and they birth mission. Let me just stop at this point and say how important community is. You were never designed to do life alone. It's not how you thrive. Zinzendorf said this, and I agree. He said this, there can be no Christianity without community. Say that with me. There can be no Christianity without community. I've heard people say, oh, I'm a Christian. I just don't go to church. <laughs> okay, you know, I get it. Technically, you can be a Christian without going to church. But the reality is, this is not God's best because Christian, because you are not, it's not how God designed it. You were designed to be in community. Yeah, you can technically live the Christian. I mean, you can't live the Christian life without being in community. I mean, you can sit at home with your Bible on your, on your sofa and not have any relationship with any other believers. I get it but actually God's best for you is you're in community. And it's in that environment you're changed, you're transformed, you're a blessing, you're blessed, you're challenged, you challenge, and you're sent out and you transform. We live once and God has called us to be part of this thing called church. Church is the Greek word ecclesia, which means an assembly, a community, a gathering. And God wants you to be part of that. You know, you can't do the Christian life without church. You can be a Christian, but you can't do the Christian life without church. There are 59 one another's in the New Testament. You can't even live those unless you're in community. It says, love one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another, serve one another. If life was all just about you, then fine, do your Christianity by yourself. But you live once, God's got a big purpose and life is bigger than just you. God wants us to be in community, to be a blessing and to be blessed. Some people say, ah, but the church hurt me. It's full of hypocrites. Well, I agree, and you're one too, <laughs> as am I. Of course you're gonna get hurt in church because it's full of people, and where you get people, you get problems. But you can't quit on what Jesus won't quit on. Jesus refuses to quit in the church, so we shouldn't either. You know, if you have car trouble, you don't stop driving. <laughs> or if your roof leaks, you don't abandon your house. Fix it. We deal with our issues and we move on. I remember seeing the headlines in an in a Israeli newspaper in, in 2009. The, the headline in June 2009 was, 
woman mistakenly junks one million dollar mattress. And the story goes that this lady's daughter had seen her, her elderly mother in her lumpy mattress. I thought, that is not a nice mattress for my mother to be sleeping on. So one day when her mother was out, she thought she would bless her by buying her a new mattress and disposing of her old one. So the, the company came in, they took, got rid of the old mattress and the new mattress was delivered. Um, only to discover later on when her elderly mother came home, she was freaking out because all about a million dollars was stashed in that old mattress. That's why it was so lumpy. <laughs> and they dumped the mattress in this huge big uh, council dump on the outskirts of the town. And I mean, so the, the photograph of the newspaper showed this lady rummaging through the rubbish. But the chances of her finding it was pretty slim because every day 2,500 tonnes of rubbish is dumped on that dump. So, uh, whew. But the point, what's, what's the point of the story? The point of the story is this. Sometimes a new generation dumps what an old generation valued. And the old, in the UK, we're seeing the decline of church, mostly the traditional church, but we're seeing the decline of church. But you know what? A new generation, listen, don't dump something that the old generation valued that has incredible value in it. Incredible value. There is colossal value to this old school cool thing called the local church. It's God's plan. Be part of God's plan. Be part of this community called the church. Zinzendorf said there can be no Christianity without community. And if you've been offended at church, work it out. Resolve it. Maybe you need to repent. Maybe someone else needs to repent. But whatever happens, forgive and don't quit on church. The mission work was incredible. Let me tell you one of the stories that went out from the Moravian community. This was the mission to the slaves in the Caribbean. There was a man by the name of Anthony. He, was a, he, was, he had been a slave and he'd been bought from a slave owner in the Caribbean and he found his freedom in Europe and in Europe he came to faith in Jesus. And uh, he found his way to the Hernhut, the Moravian community, and one evening he shared his story as a former slave with the Hernhut community. And he told them of the plight of the African slaves in the Caribbean. He told them of the mistreatment. He told them how many of these African slaves, if, if they, even for a small crime, they would have their hand cut off or their foot cut off. The mistreatment was terrible. And most of the thousands of African slaves in the Caribbean had never heard about Jesus. And he was now a Christian looking on and thinking about his sister and his brother who was still there as slaves, thinking, who's going to tell my brother and sister? Many of them were involved in or affected by the witch doctors and the voodoo and had no authentic relationship with the Creator. And he was mourning their lostness. So what that evening as he was sharing with the Moravians, two particular Moravians in, the, in their 20s, um, two young men by the name of Leonard Dober and David Nitschmann, they couldn't sleep that night after hearing Anthony's testimony. And they woke up in the morning with a clear conviction that God was calling them to now go to the Caribbean, to the islands of St. Thomas and St. Crocs, to reach the African slaves there in the Caribbean. The problem was the slaves were owned by an athe British atheist slave owner who had vowed that no missionary would get near them. And this is what the atheist slave owner said. He said, he sworn, no preacher, no clergyman will ever stay on the islands. If his ship is wrecked, we will keep him in a separate house until he can, has to leave. But he is never going to talk to any of us about God. I'm through with all that nonsense. And so he has 3,000 African slaves there in the middle of the Atlantic who were unable to hear about Jesus because he wasn't allowing anyone near. So these two young Moravians courageously, radically sold themselves into lifelong slavery to be slaves alongside the 3,000 African slaves in order to reach the slaves. That's what they did. And the story goes that they sold themselves into slavery and with the money they got from the sale of themselves, they used that for a one-way ticket to the Caribbean. And as the ship was leaving from Hamburg on the river and many of the Moravian families were there waving them off and weeping as they saw them go, knowing this was probably the last time they would see them. 
they cried out to the people on the shore and this is this is what they said and this and this cry became the mantra the mission statement of the Moravian missions in the years to come they cried out may the lamb who is slain receive the reward of his suffering that's what they cried to the people on the shore and do you know what I get it I get that cry I remember when I became a Christian I remember I, I trusted Jesus as a 15 year old and I had a huge sense of relief. Ha, my sins are forgiven. I'm going to heaven. But then I remember, it's almost like it shifted. And it, do you know what? If I'm going to heaven, that's great. But what about all the thousands of people around me? And I figured, I'm grateful that I'm going to heaven, but I want to take as many people with me as possible. So I, I remember as a teenager, I became a bit radical. I remember one, one of my free periods at, at high school, I made a whole lot of posters with Bible verses on them. In the free periods, when the corridors were quiet, I went round and stuck them up all over the school. I remember being on a bus with gospel tracks and sitting there praying for people in the bus and thought, I've got to tell everyone on this bus about Jesus. So as I left the bus, I gave every single person a gospel tract. I, I, I did it nervously. I mean, I wasn't that bold, to be honest, but I just, I just felt this, I was compelled to tell people about my Saviour. May the Lamb who is slain receive the reward of his suffering. And again, it goes back to that verse at Zinzendorf. He, it says, uh, he fixed his eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of his face. Zinzendorf was motivated by the cross. <clears throat> and he said, whatever you call me to do, I will do. And here's now people from the Moravian community now seeing Jesus, the lamb who was slain, and saying, may the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. If Jesus paid the price for every human being on earth, I want to I see to it that he sees the impact of that in the lives of precious people. What a, what, a, what a motivation, what an incredible motivation. And so these precious, precious Moravians went to plant churches and reach out to people in the Caribbean. And for the next 50 years, these two Moravians labored in the West Indies uh, without any aid from any denomination or with any support from any missionary organisation. They were there as Moravians from the community. And they established churches in St Thomas, St Croc, St John's in Jamaica, Antigua in Barbados and in St Kitts. They baptised over 13,000 converts before any other missionary from any other church or denomination arrived. An incredible turnaround happens through two courageous people who literally laid their lives down on behalf of others. And I want to encourage you to be captivated with that same mission. May the lamb who is slain receive the reward of his suffering. So that's the Moravians. An incredible story. I remember the story ends with the last moments of Zinzendorf's life, where he's having an interaction with his friend David Nitzman. And he said to him this, My dear David, what has he done over our lifetime? Could you have imagined at the beginning that the Saviour would do as much as we can now see in our congregations in the dysphoria among the brethren? I indeed only, uh, I indeed, I intended only to find a few first fruits, but now there are thousands. I think Zinzendorf thought, well, God will maybe use me to see a few things, but God used him to see many things. And City on a Hill, that's my prayer, that that will be our testimony. Like a stone going into the water, hits the water, and then ripples go out. My prayer is that the impact of the lives of individuals who courageously live, who see Jesus and say, whatever you ask me to do, I will do. People with captivated with a passion that says, may the lamb who is slain receive the reward of his suffering and fearlessly tell others about Jesus and demonstrate the love of God to people who have never experienced it. And do you know the, the incredible legacy of Zinzendorf's life and the Moravians actually went beyond his life. John Wesley, the famous uh, revolutionary of the 18th century, his life was impacted by the Moravians. John Wesley, his John Wesley's dad had been a, 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 a church leader, a minister. So John Wesley, after going to school, he also decided to become a minister. It was like a career path. He didn't have a relationship with God. 
John Wesley wasn't even saved. And he trained to be for the ministry, and then he went out to be a missionary to the American Indians in Georgia. And as he was going to Georgia, he wasn't even a Christian yet. He thought he was, he was going as a missionary, he wasn't even a Christian. He didn't have an authentic relationship with God. He was just religious. As they were on the ship uh, traveling to Georgia, he became good friends with a whole group of Moravians who happened to be on the ship. And he was so impressed by their authentic faith. I guess he realized they had something he didn't. And in the middle of the ocean, the ship went into this storm. And the record talks about how they started to having to throw much of the ship's equipment overboard to lighten the ship. And literally, people were fearing for their lives. John Wesley included, they were panicking. Except for the group of Moravians who were on the deck, singing hymns to God, totally at peace and praying. John Wesley, who was panicking, was looking on at the Moravians and it made him realize they had what he didn't have. In fact, this was the record. He, this is what he, John Wesley said, thinking back to his time as a missionary. He said this, what have I myself learned in the meantime? Why? What I least, least of all expected, that I who went to America to convert others was never myself converted to God. On his return to London from that mission trip, he returned to London, found a group of Moravians, and it was that evening in London in May 1728 that John Wesley gave his life to Jesus in that Moravian meeting. John Wesley went on to become an incredible leader. He traveled quarter of a million miles on horseback and preached 43,000 sermons. He literally changed the course of the United Kingdom. The other great leader who was influenced by the Moravians was William Carey. William Carey was born a year after Zinzendorf died. And William Carey referred back to the Moravians and he said this, see what these Moravians have done? Can we not follow their example in going in obedience to our heavenly master to go out into the world and preach the gospel to the heathen? And William Carey, this small, bald man from England, a former cobbler, went out to India and he planted hundreds of churches. He translated the Bible into six different Indian languages. He set up medical clinics for the poorest of the poor. He printed the first newspaper in an oriental language. He established Asia's first college for further education. It was his persistent battling for the rights of women. After 25 year battle, he managed to cause the practice, the hideous religious practice of widow burning to be outlawed as illegal. It was William Carey who fought for that. Within 50 years of his death, there were over half a million Christians in India and the Baptist Missionary Society was formed. So you look at the impact, like the ripples going out, Zinzendorf and the Moravians not only impacted people in their generation, and City on a Hill, precious believers, God's called you not just to make a difference in the lives of people we're connecting with, but as you live for Jesus, as you live that radical with that passion for God, your life will have ripples into the generations to come, starting with your own family and beyond. Someone once said you can count the number of seeds in an orange, but you can't count the number of oranges in a seed. And we, like seeds, carry a potential to see multitudes of people impacted. In fact, I think God's called us for that. I end with Jesus who said, in John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit and fruit that would last. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you so much for the example of Zinzendorf. Thank you for the courage of the Moravians. Thank you, God, that despite the challenges, despite the threats they faced, that persecuted minority group went on to change the world. And Lord, that's our prayer. Our prayer, God, is that as believers, we could be world changers as well. And we know the key comes from fixing our eyes on Jesus. Just like Zinzendorf at the beginning of his journey as a 19 year old saw that picture of Jesus. Right now, we remember you, Lord Jesus. Who, you who are now exalted and seated in the throne, we thank you that you were on a cross. We thank you for the love that motivated you to die in our place and to rise again in the third day. We say praise your name. Thank you for what you've done for us. And I pray and we pray 
Lord, we want our lives to shine for you. Lord, whatever you ask us to do, we want to do. We want to be those who, like the Moravians say, may the lamb who is slain receive the reward of his suffering in our generation, with our friends, with our families. All right, take a moment, pray those prayers. Make a fresh commitment to Jesus. Fix your eyes on him and have a moment with God just now. Just you, between you and him, just you pray your prayers just now. Let's respond to what we've heard. While people are praying, I want to give you an opportunity today if you're joining us and you don't yet have a relationship with God. Jesus did die for you and you are a sinner and I'm a sinner. But he died in our place on the cross and through Jesus' death, our sins can be forgiven and we can be restored into a relationship with God, that very relationship you were born to have. And if that's you today and you know, I'm a sinner, what hope is there for me? There is hope. Right now, trust in Jesus. Commit your whole life to him. Believe in him and choose to become his follower. If that's you today and you're saying, I wanna do that, then pray this prayer with me just now. Say with me, dear Lord God, I'm so grateful for your love for me. Jesus, thank you, you were willing 2,000 years ago on a cross to die in my place and to rise again. I believe you're alive right now. And I believe that when you died, you paid the price for all my sins. Today, I put my faith in you. I commit my life to you. Jesus, be Lord of my life. And with your help, I want to follow you for the rest of my days. Thanks for hearing my prayer and accepting me into your family. Amen. God has heard your prayer. And so if you made that decision just there, please, could you let us know you did that? Email us or contact us at, at, at City on a Hill. We want to do everything we can to help you grow in this new faith you've got. Let's live a life that's radical. Let's live a life for the glory of God. Let's leave an impact in our generation. God bless.